Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm excited to start chapter one. Before I do, uh, I'd like to apologize for the last video uh, where I thought everything was getting mirrored at you guys. That is the way that the screen shows it to me. It shows all the text backwards. Uh, but when you actually play the video back, it looks like you can read it just fine, whatever I'm showing you. Uh, so everything that was supposed to be forwards in the last video was forwards, and everything that was supposed to be backwards was backwards, if that makes any sense. Uh, I also wanted to say, if you want to get your own copy of The NeverEnding Story to read along with me, you absolutely can. I got mine on Amazon. The paperback is $6.79, and the Kindle version that I'm reading was $8 if you just want to download it right to your phone or tablet or whatever you guys have. You don't have to. Uh, it's only if you want. If you don't, you can just keep listening to me. Uh, so, and, uh, so jumping into chapter one, it's going to be a little bit of a switch this time because we're shifting from what was happening to Bastion, who's stuck in the school attic reading this book, and we're switching to what's actually happening in the book that he's reading now. Uh, so without further ado, chapter one, Fantasia in Danger. All the beasts in Howling Forest were safe in their caves, nests, and burrows. It was midnight. The storm wind was whistling through the tops of the great ancient trees. The towering trunks creaked and groaned. Suddenly, a faint light came zigzagging through the woods, stopped there and here, trembling fitfully, flew into the air, rested on a branch, and a moment later hurried on. It was a glittering sphere about the size of a child's ball. It moved in long leaps, touched the ground now and then, then bounded up again. But it wasn't a ball. It was a will-o'-the-wisp. It had lost its way. And that's something quite unusual, even in Fantasia, because ordinarily, will-o'-the-wisps make others lose their way. Inside this ball of light, there was a small, exceedingly active figure, which ran and jumped with all its might. It was neither male nor female, for such distinctions don't exist among will-o'-the-wisps. In its right hand, it carried a tiny white flag, which glittered behind it. That meant it was either a messenger or a flag of truce bearer. You'd think it would have bumped into a tree leaping like that in the darkness, but there was no danger of that, for will-o'-the-wisps are incredibly nimble and can change directions in the middle of a leap. That explains the zigzagging, but in a general sort of way, it moved in a definite direction, up to the moment when it came to a jutting crag and started back in a fright. Whimpering like a puppy, it sat down on the fork of a tree and pondered a while before venturing out and cautiously looking around the crag. Up ahead, it saw a clearing in the woods, and there, in the light of a campfire, sat three figures of different sizes and shapes. A giant, who looked as if the whole of him were made of gray stone, lay stretched out on his belly. He was almost ten feet long, propped up on one elbow, he was looking into the fire. In his weather-beaten stone face, which seemed strangely small in comparison with his powerful shoulders, his teeth stood out like a row of steel chisels. The will-o'-the-wisp recognized him as belonging to the family of rock chewers. These were creatures who lived in a mountain range inconceivably far from Howling Forest. But they not only lived in the mountain range, they also lived on it. For little by little, they were eating it up. Rocks were their only food. Luckily, a little went a long way. They could live for weeks and months on a single bite of this. For them, extremely nutritious fare. There weren't very many rock chewers, and besides, it was a large mountain range. But since these giants had been there a long time, they lived to a greater age than most of the inhabitants of Fantasia. Those mountains had come over the years to look very strange, like an enormous Swiss cheese full of holes and grottos, and that is why they were known as the Cheesy Wheezies. But the rock chewers not only fed on stone, they made everything they needed out of it. Furniture, hats, shoes, tools, even cuckoo clocks. So it was not surprising that the vehicle of this particular giant, which was now leaning against a tree behind him, was a sort of bicycle made entirely out of this material, with two wheels that looked like enormous millstones. On the whole, it suggested a steamroller with pedals. The second figure, who was sitting to the right of the first, was a little night hob. No more than twice the size of the will-o'-the-wisp, 
He looked like a pitch black furry caterpillar sitting up. He had little pink hands with which he gestured violently as he spoke, and below his tousled black hair, two big round eyes glowed like moons in what was presumably his face. Since there were night hobs of all shapes and sizes in every part of Fantasia, it was hard to tell by the sight of him whether this one had come from far or near. But one could guess that he was traveling because the, un because the usual mount of the night hobs, a large bat, wrapped in its wings like a closed umbrella, was hanging head down from a nearby branch. It took the will-o'-the-wisp some time to discover the third person on the left side of the fire, for he was so small as to be scarcely discernible from that distance. He was one of the tinies, a delicately built little fellow in a bright colored suit and a top hat. The will-o'-the-wisp knew next to nothing about tinies, but it had once heard that these people built whole cities in the branches of trees and that the houses were connected by stairways, rope ladders, and ramps. But the Tinies lived in an entirely different part of the boundless Fantasian Empire, even farther away than the rock chewers, which made it all the more amazing that the mount which had evidently carried the Tiny all this way was, of all things, a snail. Its pink shell was surmounted by a gleaming silver saddle and its bridle, as well as the reins fastened to its feelers, glittered like silver threads. The will of the wisp couldn't get over it that three such different creatures should be sitting there so peacefully, for harmony between different species was by no means the rule in Fantasia. Battles and wars were frequent, and certain of the species had been known to feud for hundreds of years. Moreover, not all the inhabitants of Fantasia were good and honorable, there were also thieving, wicked, and cruel ones. The Will-o'-the-Wisp itself belonged to a family that was hardly reputed for truthfulness or reliability. After observing the scene in the firelight for some time, the Will-o'-the-Wisp noticed that each of the three had something white, either a flag or a white scarf worn across his chest, which meant that they were messengers or flag of truce bearers, and that, of course, accounted for the peaceful atmosphere. Could they be traveling on the same business as the Will-o'-the-Wisp? What they were saying couldn't be heard from a distance because of the howling wind in the treetops. But since they respected one another as messengers, mightn't they recognize the Will-o'-the-Wisp in the same capacity and refrain from harming it? It had to ask someone the way, and there seemed little likelihood of finding a better opportunity at this hour in the middle of the woods. So plucking up courage, it ventured out of its hiding place and hovered trembling in midair, waving its white flag. The rock chewer, whose face was turned in that direction, was first to notice the will of the wisp. Lots of traffic around here tonight, he crackled. Here comes another one. Ooh, it's a will of the wisp, whispered the night hob, and his moon eyes glowed. Pleased to meet you. The tiny stood up, took a few steps towards the newcomer, and chirped. If my eyes don't deceive me, you are here as a messenger. Yes, indeed, said the will-o'-the-wisp. The tiny removed his red top hat, made a slight bow, and twittered. Oh, do join us. We too are messengers. Won't you be seated? And with his hat, he motioned toward an empty place by the fire. Many thanks, said the will-o'-the-wisp, coming timidly closer. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Blub. Delighted, said the tiny. Mine is Gluckuck. The night hob bowed without getting up. My name is Vushvazul. And mine, the rock chewer crackled, is Pjorn Kachak. All three looked at the will o' the wisp, who was wriggling with embarrassment. Will o' the wisps find it most unpleasant to be looked at full in the face. Won't you sit down, dear Blub, said the tiny. To tell the truth, said the will-o'-the-wisp, I'm in a terrible hurry. I only wanted to ask if, by any chance, you knew the way to the ivory tower. Oh, said the night hob. Could you be going to see the childlike empress? Exactly, said the will-o'-the-wisp. I have an important message for her. What does it say? The rock chewer crackled. But you see, said the will-o'-the-wisp, shifting its weight from foot to foot, it's a secret message. All three of us who have the same mission as you, replied Vushvazul, 
the night hob. That makes us partners. Maybe we even have the same message, said Gluckuck the tiny. Sit down and tell us, Pjorn Kratchark crackled. The will the wisp sat down in the empty place. My home, it began after a moment's hesitation, is a long way from here. I don't know if any of those present has heard of it. It's called Moldymore. Oh, cried the night hob delightedly. A lovely country. The will the wisp smiled faintly. Yes, isn't it? Is that all you have to say, Blub? Pjorn Kratchark crackled. What is the purpose of your trip? Something has happened at Moldymore, said the will o' the wisp haltingly. Something impossible to understand. Actually, it's still happening. It's hard to describe. The way it began was, well, in the east of our country, there's a lake. That is, there was a lake. Lake Foaming Broth, we called it. Well, the way it began was like this. One day, Lake Foaming Broth wasn't there anymore. It was gone, see? You mean it dried up? Gluckuck inquired. No, said the will o' the wisp. Then there'd be a dried up lake. But there isn't. Where the lake used to be, there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now do you see? A hole? The rock chewer grunted. No, not a hole, said the will o' the wisp despairingly. A hole, after all, is something. This is nothing at all. The three other messengers exchanged glances. What who does this nothing look like? asked the night hob. That's just what's so hard to describe, said the will the wisp unhappily. It doesn't look like anything. It's like, it's like, oh, there's no word for it. Maybe, the tiny suggested. When you look at the place, it's as if you were blind. The will o' the wisp stared open mouthed. Exactly, it cried. But where? I mean, how? I mean, have you had the same? Wait a minute, the rock chewer crackled. Was it only this one place? At first, yes, the will o' the wisp explained. That is, the place got bigger little by little, and then all of a sudden, Foggle, the father of the frogs who lived in Lake Foaming Broth with his family, was gone too. Some of the inhabitants started running away, but little by little the same thing happened to other parts of Moldymore. It usually started with just a little chunk, no bigger than a partridge egg. But then these chunks got bigger and bigger. If somebody put his foot into one of them by mistake, the foot or hand or whatever else he put in would be gone too. It didn't hurt. It was just that a part of whoever it was would be missing. Some would even fall in on purpose if they got too close to the nothing. It has an irresistible attraction. The bigger the place, the stronger the pull. None of us could imagine what this terrible thing might be, what caused it, and what we could do about it. And seeing that it didn't go away by itself, but kept spreading, we finally decided to send a messenger to the childlike empress to ask her for advice and help. Well, I'm the messenger. The three others gazed silent, slightly. Sorry. The three others gazed silently into space. After a while, the night hob sighed. Oh, it's the same where I come from, and I'm traveling on the exact same errand. Oh. The tiny turned to the will o' the wisp. Each one of us, he chirped, comes from a different province of Fantasia. We've met here entirely by chance, but each one of us is going to to the childlike empress with the same message. And the message, grated the rock chewer, is that all Fantasia is in danger. The will o' the wisp cast a terrified look at each one in turn. If that's the case, it cried, jumping up, we haven't a moment to lose. We were going to start, said the tiny. We only stopped to rest because it's so awfully dark here in the howling forest. But now that you've joined us, Blub, you can light the way. Impossible, said the will o' the wisp. Would you expect me to wait for someone who rides a snail? Sorry. But it's a racing snail, said the tiny, somewhat miffed. Otherwise, whoo-hoo, the night hob sighed. 
We won't tell you which way to go. Who are you people talking to? The rock chewer crackled. And sure enough, the Will-o'-the-Wisp hadn't even heard the other messenger's last words, for it was already flitting through the forest in long leaps. Oh well, said the tiny, pushing his top hat onto the back of his head. Maybe it would have been... Maybe it wouldn't have been such a good idea to follow a will-o'-the-wisp. To tell the truth, said the night hob, I prefer to travel on my own, because I, for one, fly. With a quick hoo-hoo, he ordered his bat to make ready, and whish, away he flew. The rock chewer put out the campfire with the palm of his hand. I, too, prefer to go by myself, he crackled in the darkness. Then I don't need to worry about squashing some wee creature. Rattling and grinding, he rode his stone bicycle straight into the woods, now and then thudding into a tree giant. Slowly, the clatter receded into the distance. Gluckuck the tiny was last to set out. He seized the silvery reins and said, All right, we'll see who gets there first. Giddy up, the old timer, giddy up! And he clicked his tongue. And then there was nothing to be heard but the storm, but the storm wind howling in the treetops. Now we shift back to Bastion. The clock in the belfry struck nine. Reluctantly, Bastion's thoughts turned back to reality. He was glad the, the never-ending story had nothing to do with that. He didn't like books in which dull, cranky writers describe humdrum events and the very humdrum lives of humdrum people. Reality gave him enough of that kind of thing. Why should he read about it? Besides, he couldn't stand it when a writer tried to convince him of something, and these humdrum books, it seemed to him, were always trying to do just that. Bastion liked books that were exciting, or funny, or that made him dream. Books where made-up characters had marvelous adventures. Books that made him imagine all sorts of things. Because one thing he was good at, possibly the only thing, was imagining things so clearly that he almost saw and heard them. When he told himself stories, he sometimes forgot everything around him and awoke, as though from a dream. Only when the story was finished, and this book was just like his own stories. In reading it, he had heard not only the creaking of the big trees and the howling of the wind in the treetops, but also the different voices of the four comical messengers. And he almost seemed to catch the smell of moss and forest earth. Down in the classroom, they were starting in on nature study. That consisted almost entirely in counting pistols and, and stamens. Bastion was glad to be up here in his hiding place where he could read. This, he thought, was just the right book for him. A week later, Bush Vazul, the little night hob, arrived at his destination. He was the first, or rather, he thought he was first because he was riding through the air. Just as the setting sun turned the clouds to liquid gold, he noticed that his bat was circling over the labyrinth. That was the name of an enormous garden extending from horizon to horizon and filled with the most bewitching scents and dreamlike colors. Broad avenues and narrow paths twined their way among copses, lawns, and beds of the rarest, strangest flowers in a design so artful and intricate that the whole plain resembled an enormous maze. Of course, it had been designed only for pleasure and amusement, with no intention of endangering anyone, much less warding off an enemy. It would have been useless for such purposes, and the childlike empress required no such protection, because in all the unbounded reaches of Fantasia, there was no one who would have thought of attacking her. For that, there was a reason, as we shall soon see. While gliding soundlessly over the flowery maze, the night hob sighted all sorts of animals, in a small clearing between lilacs and laburnum, a group of young unicorns was playing in the evening sun, and once, glancing under a giant bluebell, he even thought he saw the famous phoenix in its nest. But he wasn't quite certain, and such was his haste that he didn't want to turn back to make sure. For at the center of the labyrinth there now appeared, shimmering in fairy whiteness, the ivory tower, the heart of Fantasia, and the residence of the childlike empress. The word tower might give someone who has never seen it the wrong idea. It had nothing of the church or castle about it. The ivory tower was as big as a whole city. From a distance, it looked like a pointed mountain peak, twisted like a snail shell. Its highest point was deep in the clouds. 
Only on coming closer could you notice that this great sugar loaf consist of, consisted of innumerable towers, turrets, domes, roofs, oriels, terraces, arches, stairways, and balustrades, all marvelously fitting together. The whole was made of the whitest Fantasian ivory, so delicately carved in every detail that it might have been taken for the lattice work of the finest lace. These buildings housed the childlike empress's court, her chamberlains and maidservants, wise women and astrologers, magicians and jesters, messengers, cooks and acrobats, her tightrope walkers and storytellers, heralds, gardeners, watchmen, tailors, shoemakers and alchemists. And at the very summit of the great tower lived the childlike empress in a pavilion shaped like a magnolia blossom. On certain nights, when the full moon shone most gloriously in the starry sky, the ivory petals opened wide, and the childlike empress would be sitting in the middle of the glorious flower. Riding on his bat, the little night hob landed on one of the lower terraces where the stables were located. Someone must have announced his arrival, for five imperial grooms were there waiting for him. They helped him out of his saddle, bowed to him, and held out the ceremonial welcome cup. As etiquette demanded, Vushvazul took only a sip and then returned the cup. Each of the grooms took a sip. Then they bowed again and led the bat to the stables. All this was done in silence. On reaching its appointed place, the bat touched neither food nor drink, but immediately rolled up, hung itself head down on a hook, and fell into a deep sleep. The little night hob had demanded a bit too much of his mount. The grooms left it alone and crept away from the stable on tiptoes. In the stable, there were many other mounts. Two elephants, one pink and one blue, a gigantic griffin with the four quarters of an eagle and the hind quarters of a lion, a winged horse whose name was once known even outside of Fantasia but is now forgotten, several flying dogs, a few other bats, and several dragonflies and butterflies for especially small riders. In other stables, there were still other mounts which didn't fly, but ran, crawled, hopped, or swam, and each had a groom of its own to feed and take care of it. Ordinarily, one would have expected to hear quite a cacophony of different voices, roaring, screeching, piping, chirping, croaking, and chattering. But that day, there was utter silence. The little night hob was still standing where the grooms had left him. Suddenly, without knowing why, he felt dejected and discouraged. He too was exhausted after the long trip, and not even the knowledge that he had arrived first could cheer him up. Suddenly, he heard a chirping voice. Hello, hello, if it isn't my good friend Vushvazul. So glad you've finally made it. The night hob looked around, and his moon eyes flared with amazement, for on a balustrade, leaning negligently against a flower pot, stood Gluckuk the Tiny, tipping his red top hat. Hoo-hoo! went the bewildered night hob, and again, hoo-hoo! He just couldn't think of anything better to say. The other two haven't arrived yet. I've been here since yesterday morning. How? Hoo-hoo! How did you do it? Simple, said the Tiny, with a rather condescending smile. Didn't I tell you I had a racing snail? The night hob scratched his tangled black head fur with his little pink hand. I must go to the childlike empress at once, he said mournfully. The tiny gave him a pensive look. Hmm, he said. I put in for an, appoint for an appointment yesterday. Put in for an appointment, asked the night hob. Can't we just go in and see her? I'm afraid not, chirped the tiny. We'll have a long wait. You can't imagine how many messengers have turned up. The night hob sighed. How come? You'd better take a look for yourself, the tiny twittered. Come with me, my dear Wushvazul. Come with me. The two of them started out. The high street which wound around the ivory tower in a narrowing spiral was clogged with a dense crowd of the strangest creatures. Enormous, beturbaned jinns, tiny kobolds, three-headed trolls, bearded dwarfs, glittering fairies, goat-legged fawns, nixies with wavy golden hair, sparkling snow sprites, and countless others were milling about, standing in groups, or sitting silently on the ground, discussing the situation, or gazing glumly into the distance. Vushvazul stopped still when he saw them. Oh, he said, what's going on? 
What are they all doing here? They're all messengers, Gluckuck explained. Messengers from all over Fantasia, all with the same message as ours. I've spoken to several of them. The same menace seems to have broken out everywhere. The night hob gave vent to a long, wheezing sigh. <sighs> Do they know, he asked, what it is and where it comes from? I'm afraid not. Nobody knows. What about the childlike empress? The childlike empress, said the tiny in an undertone, is ill, very ill. Maybe that's the cause of this mysterious calamity that's threatening all Fantasia. But so far, none of the many doctors who've been conferring in the Magnolia Pavilion has discovered the nature of her illness or found a cure for it. That, said the night hob breathlessly, is terrible. So it is, said the tiny. In view of the circumstances, Vushvazul decided not to put in for an appointment. Two days later, Blub, the will the wisp arrived. Of course, it had hopped in the wrong direction and made an enormous detour. And finally, three days after that, Pjorn Krachark, the rock chewer, appeared. He came plodding along on foot, for in a sudden frenzy of hunger, he had eaten his stone bicycle. During the long waiting period, the four so unalike messengers became good friends. From then on, they stayed together. But that's another story, and shall be told another time. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you later for chapter two. Have a good one!